But the rest of the homework, well, not the rest of the homework, but the book homework for chapter two will be drawn from the exercises at the end of the chapter, specifically just two of them. One is write pseudocode. No, that's not it. I actually don't want you to do pseudocode. I'd rather you actually write a program that does it. So I'll copy and paste the text and make it an actual assignment. But the problem is going to be write a program that will, one, ask the user to input the length of a side of a square, two, compute the square's area, and three, print the square's area. So that's really pretty easy as long as you know how to calculate this, the square root of something. I am absolutely sure there is a square root function in the math library. Probably something to the effect of like that. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm totally spacing out. It's the area of a square. It's just the uh, the edge times the edge. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. Okay, so that was really, that's really easy to figure out. Where I was going with this one was how to get the square root of a number. There's two ways you can do it. One is to use a square root function. The other is used to the power of, but raise it to the power of one half. That's the same thing as taking the square root. So if you took a value and raised it to the power of 0 0.5, that's the same thing as doing the square root. So either one of these would calculate the square root. But that's not what the equation is. I mean, that's not what the assignment is. This assignment is just about trivial compared to what we've been doing at this point. Then the next one, the next part of it, is given this flowchart or this pseudocode, enter a program that'll do this. It'll ask for the temperature in Celsius. It'll Enter the temperature, then it'll print, is it raining? You'll input raining. And then if the temperature is greater than 10 and raining equals no, then walk, else print drive. So really that one also is pretty easy. Does that make sense, both of those? I'll clean them up and, and post the instructions. Pretty easy stuff. I think we're going to be done with chapter two or awfully quickly. Is this a C++? Yeah. Well, I could lecture from that. Well, the code is similar, but let's actually try to get the right one. Thank you for noticing. Java chapter two. All right, really, that's as far as we've gotten. Okay, so the if statement, we've talked about it having three forms, just if, then do something, or if, do something else, do something, or if, do something, else if, do something, else if, do something, as many different else ifs as you want. So following if within the parentheses is a condition, a condition that evaluates the true or false. In its simplest form, it could just be this, if true. But are you going to do that? No. However, later on, we'll, we will actually type in code that looks like this, while true. And that would be an infinite loop, except you can provide code that would bail out of the loop under certain circumstances. Now not, now, not all texts recommend or teach using a while true as a way to loop until a condition is met. Cool. Poltergeists. But you'll see me demonstrate it over and over. It's just a habit I got into. So if the condition is false, the if statement, of course, is not executed. So you can do something like this. Say temperature is equal to 10 degrees. Then you can put cold 
is equal to temperature less than 10. Then you could do if cold. For that to work, this would have to be a Boolean variable. Once you've done that, you've cached the value of this expression, temp less than 10. So cold is now a flag, a conditional variable which holds, which uh, controls the if statement, the result of the if statement. But you don't have to do that. Usually we just put the expression right there. The same thing could be accomplished if you did this, if temperature is less than 10. Why would you do this? Well, it's kind of self-documenting. We see cold, co the word cold there, you know. So by documenting your flags in the form of making them Boolean variables, you can make the readability of your code a little bit easier, or you could just do this. Wow, it's cold. Okay. Yeah. Either one's fine. I know we have done this. I wish I had looked at the video. Yeah, that's where we were which is really about one of the last things. All right, three kinds of loops. The loop statement we're going to be working with at first is the while loop. The way the while loop works is the same way as the if statement does. The code only goes into it if this expression is true. However, it then, once it hits the close brace, it then executes, well, it checks the condition again. And if it's still true, then it executes the body of the loop again. So this is silly because it would be an infinite loop, an infinite loop being one that would execute forever or until the program was terminated. Why? Because there's no way to bail out of it. So that's a pretty dumb loop. Here's a more reasonable one. x is equal to 0 while x is less than 10. Print x. And of course, we know that we actually have to make a system.out.print. And then x plus plus. That is kind of your canonical loop there. So if this expression is true, it executes this code, it adds 1 to x, and then it comes back up here. Is this condition still true? Yeah, it is, because x is equal to 1. And it keeps repeating until x is no longer less than 10. So this would print out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So there are other kinds of loops. Besides the while, there are also do loops and for loops. While loop is a pretest loop. And what I mean by that is before the body, the test comes before the body of the code. There are also post-test loops, which would execute the body of the code and then check to see if the condition was true. And if the condition was true, it would repeat. But this is, this is a pretest. So while loops are pretest, meaning that the test occurs and then the body of the code is executed. The test precedes the body of the loop. There is a side effect of that, which is that if this condition is false, it won't even go into the, into the loop, just like if the if statement was false. So we do temp is equal to 100. If temp is less than 10, or while temp is less than 10, print it's cold, and then get the new temp. Temp is equal to scanner dot next int, whatever, you know, something like that. This code will never be entered. Just like if this is an if statement. This isn't true. So it won't go in here. Well, this is a while statement. It's not true, so we don't execute this code. So with a while, with a pretest loop, there's always a possibility that this code might not even be executed. Now, if you write it in a certain way, you know it will be. You know, like if I do that, obviously it will. But there's nothing guaranteeing it just in the, in the structure of the program, in the logic of a while loop. So three ways of looping. You can have a counter loop. A counter loop is where you just know how many times you're going to loop, and so you implement it to do that. Loop a certain number of times. 
That's one way. You're going to print happy birthday 10 times. You're going to add the numbers between 1 and 100. That kind of thing. You know in advance how many times you're going to loop through the code. And those are pretty easy to write. Here's an example of one up here. This would count from 0 to 9. So that's a counter loop. Another one is a one that is terminated by user query. That's when it runs for a while and then asks, run again? Yes, no. That kind of thing. And you choose yes and it does it again. If you choose no, it bails out. So we could do something like that as well. Let's do this. Run again is equal to 1. While run again is equal to 1, we do something, whatever it is, and then we ask print, do you wish to run again? Print one for yes, two for no. And then we would have to get that input. Run again is equal to in dot next in. That kind of thing. This would be a user query loop. And then the third kind is what's known as a sentinel value that terminates your loop. And a sentinel value, I am taping, yeah, is the kind of program that says enter your bowling score or negative one to quit or something like that. So that you can enter an indeterminate number of values until they type in a special value. That's a little bit different than this because here, we are doing something and then we're asking the user whether they want to quit and in a sentinel loop way of terminating a loop then we're asking the user for a value and if the value is one thing we do something with it and if it's another then we quit so an example of this might be I don't know um, print how old are you and then we would get that value, age is equal to in dot next int, then we could do something with that. If age is greater than 99, print, gosh, you're old. Okay, so that's our do something portion of it. You can see that two inputs are required for every execution of it. The first, I mean, it runs, it says, how old are you? You type in 20, it doesn't print, you're old. It says, do you wish to run again? You choose one. Run again is set to 1, so it continues, it loops again, then it asks again, how old are you? 40. You run. doesn't print anything. Do you wish to run again? 1. How old are you? You type in 200. Prints, gosh, you're old. Do you wish to run again? And by now you're really bored with this program, so you choose 2 for no and it bails out. So you see you're having to answer enter two bits of data per execution. Well, if that's the sort of thing you're doing, you could perhaps shorten it to where you only had to enter one bit of information and then the decision would be based whether to do something with the data you entered or whether to terminate. Ask the user for input and terminate if the input is a special value. So that would look a little bit different. That would be something like this. And here is the kind where you can do it with what I call a while true loop. It's not the only way to structure one of these, but while true means it'll run forever until it finds something that gets it out of there. And in that case, or in this case, it's a break statement that'll get us out of there. So we could do something like this. Print, enter your age 
print or minus one to quit. Then we would get their age. Age is equal to in dot next int. Then we would check. If age is equal to negative one, that's our special value. That's our sentinel value. And if that's true, we break. A break causes us to leave the while loop. It looks for the closing parentheses of the while loop, and then execution continues after that point. Else, we would do this business about if age is greater than 99, print gosh year old. You don't actually have to put that in an else, though, because that's kind of implied. If it doesn't break, everything after that is an else. But if you want to, you could put it like that. But I'm not going to. There you go. Does that make sense? So a signal value is when you enter one piece of data, but it's treated two ways. If it's a special value, it terminates the loop. If it's not a special value, then you do whatever you're supposed to do with that value. So that's good for like entering, you know, prices or something like that, or inventories, or, you know, test scores. You keep entering a student's grade, but it, when you finally enter a minus one, then it quits the loop. That makes sense? Okay. Here's how they worded it. A counter loop. That's when you use a counter variable to keep track of the number of iterations. A user query. Ask the user if he wants to continue. Or a sentinel value. Use the special value to indicate that there's no more input. Here's a different example. Write an algorithm that asks for numbers and prints their squares. The program should continue as long as the user answers Y to a continue prompt. So set continue to Y. While continue equals Y. This is a really bad variable name, by the way, because that's actually a keyword. Don't use continue as a variable name. It won't even compile. But be that as, as it may. Set continue y. While the continue equals y, ask them to enter a number, allow them to type it in, calculate the square, print the square, then print. Continue, y in. They type in a y, it loops again because the condition is still true. But if they type in anything else other than a y, then it fails out. So that's a user query example. I'm going to make that just cont rather than continue. Now I'm going to leave that along. Okay. And then the sentinel value example. Write an algorithm that reads in bowling scores until a sentinel value of negative 1 is entered. Print the average score. So here we go. We set a total score to 0. We set our counter to 0. We ask them, enter your bowling score. We let them type it in. We also add or minus one to quit. While the score is not equal to negative one, we add what they typed into the total score. We add one to the counter, and then we ask them again, enter your bowling score. This looks different than what I showed you because it doesn't use while true. Instead, it uses what's known as a priming read. When you set up one of these sentinel value loops, you really have two ways of doing it. One is with a while true, or the other is with a priming read. What's a priming read? It's the first time you print the message and let them type it in. Then, down here inside the loop, you print the message out again and let them type it in again. So this primes everything so that you can go into the loop. That's why it's called a priming read. How would we modify that to be a while true loop? Here's how it is right now. Total score equals zero. Count equals zero. Print enter score or minus one to quit. Then score equals i n dot next i n t while score is greater than or equal to zero, or not negative one, however you want to word it. Total score plus equals the score they just entered. And then the counter increments by one because we know that they've entered. 
then we would ask them again, print underscore or minus one to quit. There we go. So this is a priming read. Example of sentinel value with priming read. Prime the loop. There we go. And the other way you could do it. Oh, and then we didn't do the very the very bottom thing where we calculate the average. Average is equal to sc total score divided by count, which would blow up if they didn't enter any data, because count would be zero and you can't divide by zero. Print average is plus average. Okay, so that's doing it with a priming read. Here what we're going to do is we're not going to use a priming read and instead we're just going to do while true. We're going to ask them to enter the score and if the score equals our special value, if score is less than zero, then we break out of the loop. Else we go ahead and do that stuff. Then we could calculate the average again. Average is equal to total score divided by counter. Print average is plus average. To me, this logic looks cleaner. I don't know if you agree. I don't know if the fact that we had an if statement in the middle of this code makes it look more complicated than it did here. But to me, having only one place where we read data in is preferable to having done it in two places. Up to you. A nested loop. A nested loop is a loop inside of a loop. Let's do an example of a nested loop. Let's actually open up that means now. Okay, here we go. We're going to do int game on is equal to 1 or continue is equal to 1. Something like that while continue is equal to 1, then we're going to do some other kind of loop. Maybe count to 10. I don't know. Int x is equal to 0, while x is less than 10, print happy birthday. And then add 1 to x. Why do we have to add one to x? Because otherwise we're not changing the value of the iterator of the counter and so it'll run forever. That, now this is the inner loop. This is the outer loop. We're done with the inner loop. We're done printing happy birthday 10 times. That may have been so much fun that they might want to do it again. System.out.println repeat program. and then let them type that in. C-O-N-T is equal to I-N dot next I-N-T. Now for this I-N dot next I-N-T to work, we have to actually import the scanner class. So I'm gonna whip up here, import java dot util dot scanner, and then I have to create the scanner. So scanner I-N is equal to new scanner system dot I-N. Does that make sense? Nested loops? You can put in as many loops inside of loops inside of loops as you want. The inner loop runs, it does something over and over and over. When that loop is done, then it comes back and checks to see if the outer loop is still valid. If it is, the whole thing repeats again over and over. So if we ran this, what it would do is it would print happy birthday 10 times. It would ask them, do you wish to repeat it? If they typed in a one, I guess we should tell them. One equals yes, two equals no.
happy birthday, happy birthday. Repeat. Yeah. It does it again. Repeat. Getting more exciting each time you watch it. We better stop. There we go. And the program stops. That's the idea of a nested loop. You can also have nested if statements. Or you can nest your loop inside of an if statement. Or you can nest an if statement inside of a loop. You know, the term nested just means putting one example in the body of another. So here's our example. Set continue equal to y. There comes that bad variable name again. While continue equals y, set the biggest equal to negative 1. Enter a number. We ask the user to enter a number. We let them type it in. If they enter a negative number, we quit. While the number that they type in is greater than or equal to 0, we check to see if what they just typed in is, entered to the, is larger than the biggest value entered so far, which is equal to negative 1. If it is, then that becomes the new largest number. So you can type in a series of numbers, and if the number you currently typed in is larger than the biggest number found so far, that becomes the new biggest. Eventually, you'll get tired of playing that game, and so if they type in a negative number, it'll exit the loop. Well, it'll run down here, and then it'll say print play another game, and they input continue. And if they do wish to continue, then the outer loop iterates once more, and we go back inside the inner loop again. All right, this is the world's lamest quiz. It's only got one question in it. Well, it's got two questions. Is it possible for a while loop to have zero iterations? Can you make a while loop that doesn't execute the body of the code at all? You certainly can. Absolutely you can. Here, I'll give you an example of one. If false, or excuse me, while false, do something important. This condition is false. It'll never execute the code. Now that's kind of silly, but you could do the same thing. Temp is equal to zero. While temp is greater than 10, do something. Is that going to do anything? I mean, if there was code here. No, because temp is not greater than zero. So both of these are examples of code with zero iterations. Now this looks just like a, a flat out programming error. This one is also a programming error, but it's possible that we're reading in temp, you know, like this. And if they type in certain values of, uh, of temp, then it might go ahead and do that thing. But if they type in other values, a number less than or equal to 10, then it wouldn't do anything. So what is a sentinel value used for? Does it A, specify the first value printed, B, print an error message, or C, signal the end of the input? C. Are we all in agreement? Going once, going twice, final answer, that's correct. So just as a refresher, what are the three kinds of, of loops that we use? The, the first one that uh, we wrote down is what? A counter loop, right. And then the second one is a user query, where we ask the user, do you wish to repeat yes, no? OK, so to do the programs that we're going to do, you're going to need to know how to use a scanner. But there, that's how we do a scanner. You have to have this line here, import java.util.scanner. We can go ahead and put a comment. Scanner is used for input from keyboard. That's just our example. class 2B and in class 2C. Let's see what else we may feel like doing today. I think that we ought, we probably already have this knowledge, but change the pseudocode on page 8 into working Java code. Well, is it still page 8 of the PowerPoint? Let's go look.
No. <laughs> All right. That no longer matches the uh, PowerPoint. How about if we just look up the word lightning? Is, is there anything in there? Why is it jumping to that slide? I don't see, oh, alternative, slightly less intuitive solution. Okay, yeah. Well, we won't do 2B then. Let's check to see what 2C is. We'll delete 2B. Three ways to loop. I guess that's just making y'all type this in. What do you think? Can you understand these concepts without typing this stuff in, or do we need to do an in-class assignment where we, where we create three different kinds of loops? Take a vote. You want to do the in-class? Raise a hand. I don't see a lot of hands going up. Let's make sure everybody's awake. Should we skip the lab? Raise your hand. Okay, cool. All righty. So we don't need to do either one of those things, in my opinion. Go look at chapter three. We don't have chapter three. Why do we not? Okay, here we go. Move that over into unit one. Now we have chapter three. Java basics. Well, we've already been doing this, so now we're gonna learn the basics. Our first Java program. Here we go, it's a hello world program. We've done this already. What is the important takeaway from this? That every program you write in Java will have a class name. The class name matches the file name. It also will have a main of some kind. The main will take the form, unless it's a graphical user interface, of this exact syntax, public static void main, with string. The only thing that's optional here is, is the name of the args variable. You have to have both of those things in order to get a program to run in Java. And then for every opening brace, we have to have a closing brace. And good programming style dictates that we put comments at the top of our program explaining who wrote it and what it does. We don't really know what the word public means yet. We don't even really know what the word class means. We certainly probably don't know what the word static or void mean. But just roll with it. This is what we need at the minimum to keep our program running. Comments, we know what comments are. Comments explain what the program is doing. They're just for the human to read. The code ignores them. Class name and source code file name. All Java programs must be enclosed in a class. You should only put one class per file. You really can get away with putting multiple classes in one file, but don't do that. By the time we start needing multiple classes, put each one in its own file. The name of the program file must match the name of the program class, exactly, down to the uh, capitalization and lower cases, with the difference that the file name also has .java. Proper style dictates that the class name start with an uppercase first letter and that no other identifier, no other variable name or, or function method does. First time I've used this particular version of the PowerPoint for this chapter. What's the name of the class in the program slide? Well, if we go back and look. Really? Where we go? There he is. 
It's hello. That's the name of the class. What is a file? A file is a group of related data. I'm not really digging this. What should the file name be for our hello program? Well, if the class is called hello, then the program will equal hello.java. If you create a program and you don't like its class name, you can fix it. But don't do a save as. That really won't help you because you'll be left with the old class still in your programming directory. What you do is you highlight the name of the class. Well, there's two ways. One is you could click on the file name over here, right click, and you could do rename, refactor rename. You can rename the class right there. This warning message is absurd. Of course, I haven't made any changes. I haven't typed anything yet. All right. Refactor rename, and I could call this one, you know, my favorite class ever. And I hit enter, and it goes, and then it does all the proper renaming in order for that to work. So now it has a new file name, my favorite class ever, and it changed that to match. Or vice versa. You highlight the name of the class, go up to refactor, rename, and that file name was really too long, so we're just going to call this hello. And then refactor, and it renames that file to hello.java, wherever it was. So to print things, to generate output, for now, we will use system.out.println. There's another way to print things, which is to use system.err.println. And then there's a third way to print things, which is using a J option pane to pop up a little dialog with an OK message. Now, obviously, that's way cooler than just printing it out on the screen. But what system.err.println does is it sends it to what's known as the error stream rather than to the system output stream. And so the compiler, not the compiler, NetBeans will put it in a different color down here. Let's send something to system.error.println. System.err.println. Wow. So if we scroll up here, it printed that in red. Why do you want to use system.err.println? Well, when you're writing a program and you're running it from the command prompt, and then you use the arrow symbol to save its output to a file, like this, dir, there I, I get to see my output, now I could do dir into d.txt, that saves the dir output to the t.txt file. So if I notepad t.txt, there's my data. But that's because it was all sent to standard out the output from the DIR program. If it sent anything to the error stream instead, we would see it anyways. It would print it here rather than be saved in t.txt. So if you're writing command line programs and um, you're expecting the user to run them from the command prompt and then there's error messages that you want displayed on the screen but not saved in the output, you could use standard.err. Otherwise, just, just use out rather than the RR, unless you really like the color red. So system.out.println, system is the class name, so we have to use a capital S. The LN indicates that it's going to go to the next line. If we leave that off, then in the next print statement, it'll be right where we left off before. So like if I do this, if I leave the LN out, and then I run this, it's going to print wow, and it's not going to go to the next line before printing wow again. So wow, wow. There we go. Notice that it printed wow, wow at the end of all this output. It printed happy birthday, it printed repeat program, and then it printed wow wow. Whereas wow wow is the very first thing that happens in our program. 
That's kind of what you get for mixing up error output and normal system.out output is you have two streams of output going and that means may display them in the wrong order. So I'm probably never going to use .err ever again in this class this semester. Just letting you know that it's there and if you see code on the internet with it now you know what it is. Okay now it's in its right place. It printed wow, it printed wow again and it printed happy birthday and it was all on the same line because we didn't do print ln. We could imitate that by doing that slash in there and slash in there. Then when we ran it, each one of those things would go to the next line. Like that. Compile and execution. When we are done typing in our code, Usually we just head straight for the green arrow and run it, but technically several different things are going on. The program is compiled first. We come up here, we go to run, clean, and build project. It generates some dot .cl, some dot .class files. If I go out into the source code directory now for this, see users, J. Thompson, J desktop, application 3, let me copy that. Go into the source, go here. I see my .java file. In another directory here is a file with the extension .class. That got stored in Java application build classes. It's stored in a, in a completely different subdirectory. You don't really need to know what's in that file. Just know that it's a compiled version of the program. It's not machine coded, but it's an intermediate step between high level Java and machine code. And that dot class contains the code that the Java runtime engine can then execute and turn into machine code. Now when we compiled it, not only did it make the dot class file, but then it combined all the dot class files into what's known as a jar file. I guess because a jar holds all your stuff. So you can run this program from the command line by executing the line that it gives you down here at the bottom. And what that does is it runs Java and then it gives the path to the jar file. So uh, there we go. I'm going to run java-.jar and it runs my program. Oh, now that I'm running it from the command prompt, I should put those standard.errs back in. What is this? Let's build it again. Clean and build. Now I can run it again the same way. It says, what is this? Which looks the same, but then if I pipe its output to a file, this. I'm going to save it to a file called t.txt out in the t directory. It still showed what is this because that went to the error stream rather than to the normal output stream. And now if I go out there and I notepad the t.txt file we see that that text, the error text, was not saved there. So that .class file is what's known as bytecode. Bytecode is an intermediate language between the high-level Java and the low-level Java. If we go out and we look up Java bytecode hello world, we'll see that it looks significantly different. Here we go. This is what the compiler would change that Hello World program into. It looks about the same thing, but, but well, I mean, well, 
it doesn't really. We see a method, a main here. We see some words here. We see this get static. No, I don't really know what, what this is doing at all, except I can guess that this invoke virtual is then going to run this print command with this string, and that string apparently contains the text hello world. But you can see that this is not nearly as readable as uh, our hello world was. For example, I don't know the connection between that and that, you know. This doesn't seem to have a name. So how does this work? I don't know. But there we go. This is hello world written in bytecode. Bytecode is what's contained in the .class file. It's not, con it's not uh, saved as text, though. You can't go in and edit it as text. It's saved in, in a kind of, not encrypted, but in a in bytecode format. So that file that got compiled was called .class. And if we were doing everything from the command prompt, I would make you type in programs with notepad. You could create a program called t.java. It would have to have public class t. Then it ha would have to have public static void main string args. Then we could make it do something in here. Let's just make it print hello world. There's our program. And if the Java compiler was in the path, I could type Java C space T dot Java and it would run the compiler. Unfortunately, the Java compiler is not in the path, and I hadn't planned on, on doing this, so I didn't get the path to it put into it. The path is just a search path for things that get executed from the command prompt. Some things are in the path, some things are not. If you type P-A-T-H, you get a list of all the, the uh, things that are in the search path. So every file that is in any of these directories can be run from the command prompt because it's in the search path. However, Java C, the Java C program is not in that path, so it can't do that compilation. Identifiers. That's a technical net term for a name. Names can be classes, they can be methods, like main, or they can be variables. The identifier naming rules. They can be letters, digits, dollar signs, underscores. The first character must not be a digit. And if these rules are broken, your program won't compile. We've talked about this already, right? I don't need to make detailed notes about this. Yay, nay, we've talked about, okay. Naming conventions. Why did it? These are just conventions. Make the first letter of all variables or all methods lowercase. All classes should start with an uppercase letter. And then if you create a variable name or identifier name by concatenating multiple words together, like first name, then each additional word in it would have an initial cap. First name days in with a capital I, month with a capital M. If it's a class, then you do start it with a capital letter and then follow that same convention. Capital S, capital R, student record, work shift schedule. And your name should be descriptive. Avoid single letter variable names unless it's just a simple counter. To declare a variable, you have to give it a type. Salary here is an int. An int is a whole number. Bonus message is a string, meaning it can contain a series of characters. It may not contain any. It may be an empty string, which is just two double quotes with nothing between them. Or it could be 10,000 characters long. Salary here is being assigned the value 50,000. And then bonus message is being set equal to this message. It says bonus is equal to dollar sign and then it's got a plus sign and then it's got this calculation between parentheses. Now Java makes it easy to build strings because if you enclose expressions like this in parentheses then after that expression is calculated something called to string is called on it and so it would turn that number into a string that could be concatenated onto that. 
Now that's a little bit cryptic, but let's let's go back to our program. Let's get rid of that standard error. We're going to do int x is equal to 3. Then we're going to do string output is equal to x equals plus x, like that. Realistically speaking, that should not work. Why? Because that's a number, and this is a string. But Java says that if you have a plus sign following a string, or with string as one of the things, the other one gets an attempt to convert it to a string. So then when we print our output out, system.out.println, it will go ahead and print x equals 3. Or it won't, because I have a syntax error somewhere. Uncompilable source code, alrighty. I redefined x down here. You can't do that. Once you've defined x in a, in a method, you can't then go back and redefine it later. Some languages will let you do that. Python, er, Python will. JavaScript will. C++ will under certain circumstances. Java just flat out does not. It's to save you from trouble. Okay, so now that I run it, it's going to say x is equal to 3. So it created this string, and then the value of x was converted to a string and then concatenated. So if you see the plus sign, but one of its operands, one of the things on one of the side of the other of the plus sign is a string, then all of the items on either side of the plus sign are attempted to be converted to a string. What if this wasn't a string? What if we did this? Output is equal to 4 plus 3. And then we do system.out.println output. What is it going to print? Is it going to print 43? Or is it going to print 4 plus 3? Or is it going to print nothing because we have an error? And that is actually the correct er answer. The reason being that this plus this, these are two integers. So the result is an integer. And an integer can't be converted directly to a string like that. There are ways you can convert integers to strings. I'm going to show you the easy one. This is the cheap and easy way of converting something to a string. Just append it to an empty string. What that does is as it's processing it, it says, oh, that's a string? Well, everything after it had better be a string, too. And then it's going to tack that one on. And then it's going to tack that one on. So hopefully it'll print 43. And it did. What if we wanted this to be math, though? That's when you use those parentheses. Parentheses says, I want you to do this part of the, uh, of the expression first before you do anything else. Right, right. So that'll turn it into 7. So it's going to print out 7 rather than 43. There we go. Hope that makes sense. We're still converting it to a string for some reason, but we could just put four plus three right there. Right. You've got the four plus three. Oh, thank you. Much better. Otherwise, somebody looking at these notes like Porphyrisa go, I don't understand. These are exactly the same. So an assignment statement is something that uses a single equal sign. The single equal sign is known as the assignment operator. That is in contrast to double equals, which means comparison. 
And if you mix those up, it won't work. If I come in here and I do x is equal equal to 3, it will no longer compile. If I do this, if x equals 3, it won't compile. I have to get them right. I have to put double equals if you're doing comparison, single equals if you're doing assignment. Some languages do let you get away with this. If you're lucky, they'll, they'll print a little warning message. But what this really says is copy this 3 into x and then say if on it. So that destroys the value of whatever was in x before. So it's almost always a programming error. And so it's nice that Java doesn't even let you do that. C and C++ do. So our program template. It's our boilerplate. Since we're using NetBeans, I'm not making you type this in every time. Howsoever, you really do need to be able to type this in from scratch. Public class followed by the file name without the .java and then embraces. Then public static void main parentheses string square braces args and then parentheses excuse me braces. That's the kind of thing that could conceivably go on a quiz. Quiz? What is the programming template for the simplest program? Initialization statements are when you declare your variable and you give it a value at the same time. And you quite often see that. I mean, it's, it's here I did it. I declared x and I gave it a value of 3. I assigned it the value of 3 and I did it all at once, so that's called initializing it. I initialized it to 3. Here I declared a variable and I initialized it to this value. Really, you only say initialize the first time it's done. Here, we assign a value to output. That's its initial value. That's its starting value. Later on, we change the value of output. That's no longer an initialization. It's just an assignment. Now, maybe we've heard the term reinitialize, but no, we're not going to use that. This is the initialization. This is an assignment. An assignment and an initialization are the same thing, except the initialization is when it happens the first time. So your series of steps to declare a variable, then you can assign it a value. Whoops. If you do both in one step, it's called initialization. some examples. Here we're not initializing it. Int total score. Int max score. Total score is equal to 0. Max score is equal to 300. And here they're using comments to indicate what these things are. And this is pretty good programming. What is total score? It's the sum of all the bo bo bowling scores. What is max score? It's the default maximum bowling score. Alright, let's stop there. We'll take roll.